Okay, I welcome all of you uh, to this edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. And it's a pleasure to have one of our own colleagues, uh, Professor Shankar Ghosh from the Department of Condensed Matter Physics and Material Sciences uh, to talk about some of the very exciting things that he's doing in his lab. But before I uh, actually proceed on to formally introduce uh, Professor Shankar Ghosh, I would like to tell you what the Wednesday Colloquium really means to all of us. Um, so um, uh, ever since uh, our institute, the Data Institute of Fundamental Research, where it was founded by our director, Professor Hobi Bhava, um, there, has, uh, there was a strong push by him to have all the members of the nat natural sciences faculty members, uh, be it a physicist, chemist, or biologist, to get together once a week, four o'clock, um, on a Wednesday afternoon and uh, collect our thoughts and on or focus our thoughts on some of the very interesting problems that the community of scientists are working world over. And uh, traditionally, experts from various communities would visit TIFR, be a part of TIFR for one day and, uh, you know, give a colloquium which is broad based to everyone who is uh, listening in the audience. This tradition has carried over through a variety of years and variety of hosts. Um, and um, uh, uh, we are extremely lucky to keep this tradition on in, in the honor of Professor Hobi Bhav. Um, today is going to be no different. We have an expert, resident expert, of course, and uh, a very well known world over for his work on soft um, condensed matter physics. Um, Professor Ankar Ghosh, uh, who is going to talk about shape and functionality. Uh, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Ghosh actually um, uh, did his bachelor's from Siliguri College in North Bengal and then moved to JNU for his master's in physics. Um, then he uh, did his subsequently moved uh, for his PhD work um, at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, where he worked with Professor Ajay Sood. Um, after his work uh, with Ajay Sood, which led to a lot of very interesting discussions on conductivity of uh, carbon nanotubes, um, Shankar actually moved to TIFR as a faculty member, uh, and he has been there ever since um, for his work and contributions in soft condensed matter physics. Shankar was recently awarded in 2019 the Shanti Swarup Bhatnaga Award in Physical Sciences. Um, Shankar, without further ado, I'll let you speak now. So, uh, shape and functionality, statistics, and dynamics. Thank you, Jyotishman. Uh, so, for almost prodding me to give this talk. So, any, so, so about shapes, you know, we all have some intuitive understanding of shapes. We see shapes all around us. Uh, there are shapes which come about in nature. For example, a flower has its shape. We don't really understand its fun, its reason why it has that particular shape. But there's other class of shape. For example, a potter basically engineers uh, his pot and uh, he has a, there's a protocol to do that. Right? So, uh, that, that is something which is going to inspire this talk of mine, is this Potter's approach of, of making shapes where the target shape is known to me. Now, uh, an advantage of being in TIFR is that you have a wonderful garden, but also you have wonderful colleagues. So there was this problem that I always dealt in my mind that how could I embed a shape starting from a fat sheet uh, and what would be the protocols to do that? And so in my long conversation that I used to have with Nitin, I once asked this question to him. And my question was uh, that, uh, you know, how do you mold a flat sheet into a desired curved surface? So here was my idea that I would start with a flat sheet and I had a way and I required a way in which I wanted to convert this flat sheet into some functional shape and this, whatever be this uh, shape, it, its nature would be a priori known to me. So I would give him a function and say that that's a function, for example, some function, which is some height as a function of X and Y. And I wanted to convert this sheet into this particular shape and I wanted a general way of doing it. Right? 
maybe for one or two, you could come up with some some quick uh, smart solutions. But would there be some some algorithmic way of getting to shapes starting from a flat sheet of paper? Now, there was a limitation to this, and the limitation was that cutting or gluing was not going to be allowed. Okay, so you couldn't cut this flat sheet of paper, neither could you use a glue or staple or anything of that sort. Now, if you look at this particular problem, uh, this kind of falls, makes you remember about this idea of origami. You know, in origami, you do the same thing. You take some piece of paper, you fold it. This is a, paper, this is, this is a plane that we all have made at some point of a time. And the problem with this is, yes, it gives you a shape. Two, it doesn't use cutting or gluing. But the problem is that it is entirely sequential in nature. So, so if you have to make a plane, you have to make certain folds. And all these folds have to be done one after the other. So in addition to the problem that I did not want cutting and gluing, I also did not want sequential folding. So here was, here was my constraint that I neither wanted cutting, neither wanted gluing, neither wanted sequential floating, and yet I wanted to come from a flat sheet of, of some material to a curved sheet. Now, before you... Shankar Deshudipta here, just one question. Sure. Is it stretchable? Do you allow okay. it to stretch? So we'll get to that point uh, okay. for the material. Yeah, sure. So why do we do this? Is because, uh, you know, if you are not a... 3D enthusiasts, and if you don't think that everything in the world is going to be made out of 3D printers, have a cursory look around you, and you'll find that almost anything that you see is made out of these flat sheets. Uh, uh, so you could look at your cloth, you could look at paper, you could look at uh, plywood, uh, almost anything. You could look at metal, glass, almost anything that you look actually comes out of flat sheets. So industrially, if something has to be made, it is in flat sheet. And by the way, when I use the word sheet, you realize that it's going to be thin. Right, some rectangular block, which is thin. Okay. Now, if you look at these materials, one of the properties of this material is going to be that you can easily bend them. So you can take a plyboard sheet, for example, like this, and you can bend them in one direction. But you can only bend them in one direction. If you try to bend them in the other direction, you know what will happen. It's going to tear apart, right? So that's the problem that you have. It's in cloth also the same thing. You can bend them in one direction, try to bend them in the other direction, you're going to tear it apart. Okay. So how does a tailor do it? The tailor does this. Let's get to this uh, way the tailor does it. What the tailor does is it takes in the shape. He cuts out small pieces of this shape. And then if he wants to introduce some curvature in the system, he will basically go up and uh, maybe introduce some darts into the system. For example, here is a dart, here is a dart. Then he would uh, stitch those two uh, parts together and then stitch the whole thing together so that you have a dress which fits in your curvy body. If you are building a hull of a boat, that's almost the same thing. That's what you do is you cut out pieces and then you, you basically you nail on those pieces to the body of your boat or ship, whatever. You know. So these, are, these shapes are known as uh, uh, developable surfaces because at the end, you can take any of these sheets, like a piece of cloth, and lay them flat on a paper, on a flat, uh, say, table. Now, but that's only one point. What typically what you want is that you want things which don't curve in one direction, but it curves in both the direction. Your sink, for example, has two directions of curves. You know, most ball has two directions in which things are curved. So you basically want a doubly curved surface. And if you're truly, and this is what Sudipto was mentioning, that if you are truly in a in a non-stretchable limit, then you will not be able to uh, do this, right? So. So if you took paper, for example, and tried to crease on paper onto a ball, you realize that you cannot do this because you're going to have some creases on it and the creases are not going to be smooth. On the other hand, if you try to do with a cloth, and cloth also we realize that it was not stretchable in a sense. So you can shear the cloth, but it's, you can't stretch it in the other direction. It's, the yarns are pretty stiff. A cloth can do that. And that's because a cloth is kind of made out of fibers, and these fibers have this network structures in them. Now, sure enough, you know, this kind of a problem would be thought by a mathematician. And it was Chebyshev who actually thought about this. And this was 1853, 1856, and the Crimean War. And Chebyshev was working on this problem of how to make uh, you know, uniforms for, for uh, the soldiers. And his, his, the question posed to him was very simple. 
is just that you know you make the optimized condition of the clock and the second problem was there is this particular sim on the shoulder of the of your uh, soldier and that seemed to be difficult to make and so he was posed this problem what could be or what could mathematicians do about it and chebyshev defined this problem as two uh, particular problems in which he worked on the first problem is that he said that well uh, let's ask this question how well can fabrics mimic a shape so essentially i told you this you know that about a ball could a could a fabric actually cover the entire ball and we'll see that you know it's an important problem when we discuss the situation that i will study or it can only do with an hemisphere and second of all is that what are the cuts that you need to make you know you need to make certain cuts and what are the cuts that you need to make and obviously you have to make some assumptions and this was the assumptions that he made he said well you know cloths are not like continuous objects like the paper they are made up of two perpendicular uh, fibers and both are non extensible and these are called as warp for the belt in hindi we call them as tane bane uh your threads in him is was rigid uh at the intersection point which would mean that a b c d these are the points that the threads are crossing each other but think of these points as glued to each other okay so that basically the distance a b along the arc b c c d and b a does not change as a function after after you shear things up then you said that okay fine you start with a with a square where all the angles are 90 degrees but then your only flexibility is at your angle so you basically get go from about 90 degrees to something which is any any angle is possible for you okay so that was what he did and so essentially what happened was you started with something which was squares to start off with but then you went into something which was which was highly polygonal like a parallelogram with very different angles right so that was the thing that he did and he he asked some practical questions of what kind of shapes that you could make out of this one of these shapes is something that you regularly use in your kitchen and this is the kitchen strainer that you use now you look at a kitchen strainer this is basically a mesh you have converted it into a half hemisphere and if you look at this particular uh, mesh and if you flatten it out so if you cut out this and if you flatten it out you will find that the symmetry in this problem is not the symmetry of the original kitchen sink strainer in a kitchen strainer it's a circular symmetry what you have is kind of a squareish symmetry so this one if you if you if you bend it you would basically get a kitchen strainer so if you want to make two hemisphere a sphere chevishev's idea was to take these two parts and basically join them together okay that would be a sphere for you and people who are interested in this particular topic there was a wonderful talk way up in 13th april 2012 by tangis on how how mathematicians use geometry to cut cloth and where he actually discusses how you can use this kind of a what he calls as a as a chevishev's net to actually wrap on to a sphere But, but practically we are here that what we have is we have realized that you know we are going to have some mesh on our surface any surface can be converted to a mesh and essentially what we have is a problem of converting little squares on on our flat sheet into little parallelograms okay and then the way that you can do a parallelogram uh, construction from a square is basically by putting two diagonals in if you pull the diagonals and push the diagonals then you can convert these kinds of uh, squares into this kind this is a square which you have on a flat sheet this is a square which you have on a uh, on a on a on a curved surface so this is, we are not really dealing with with materials which cannot be stretched it can locally be stretched and sheared the other way of doing this is actually pretty interesting is what you do use regularly which is called as an umbrella now if you look at an umbrella in its open condition the umbrella umbrella is certainly a doubly curved surface right you it's it's a positive gaussian curvature you have a curving in one direction you also have the curving in the other direction but if you close down the umbrella then along the length of the umbrella it's not a curved surface so that k1 stands for a curvature so curvature is zero if you go in the other direction if you are going in the cylinder in the azimuthal direction then obviously it is curved so you can go from an umbrella open condition which is a doubly curved surface to something which is a closed condition which is not a doubly the which is basically a gaussian curvature is zero it's a singularly curved surface is by tucking in so what you do is all the extra cloth that you have you're going to tuck it in okay so this is kind of an ap- approach that we are going to take we are going to take an approach first trying to convert this tucking in business if we can do in some way this is something which you do in uh, origami also but do it in a much more complicated way and secondly we'll try and see that can we actually change those little squares that we drew up and converted this into little parallelograms what would be the algorithms to do that 
So now the material that we have is a very simple material, and this is called the Trinkiri. And people who have seen this, you can buy them off in Amazon. They're like 500, 600 rupees for a packet. They uh, appear like an over, uh, overhead transparency sheets. Basically, these are materials where you have polymers which are frozen in a stretched state. So when you stretch a positive polymer and freeze them, then that is a very high entropy, a very low entropy state for the system. So essentially, any polymer would like to be in a coiled state, right? So if you and in a coiled state, you can have many configurations. But if you stretch the polymer and then freeze it, then it's in a very low entropy state. It just has that particular configuration. In it. So you have any heat to it. The once it crosses the glass transition temperature, its tendency is to shrink down because that's when it can get into the coiled stretch. So so that's what that's this material that you have. Uh, uh, these are also materials which in some way, all these heat shrink tubes are also like this, okay. Uh, the thing that we could use is that what you can do is you can paint a portion of this particular thing is black and then apply heat to it. And if you apply heat to it, that, that little black portion absorbs the heat, gets hotter. And what you do to heat this system is simple. Those physiotherapy lamps that you have is good enough for it. So you can apply and you can just brighten it up with this. So here the black portion is going to absorb the heat. It's going to become hotter. As it becomes hot, it wants to go into this high entropy state. And essentially, that would mean that it has to have a contraction. It will contract off. So, so this is what happens. The moment I shine the light on it, you can't see the light because it's filtered out. But the moment you shine the light on it, there is a little contraction of it, and the thing actually comes down. So this is what you have. But these are practical materials, so it has its own limitations. One of the limitations which we use properly is that you paint it on only one side, right? But realize these are these are finite thicknesses, maybe about. 200 microns, 150 micron thicknesses. So if you have this 200, 150 micron thicknesses, and if you are going to paint them in black, then you're going to contract the top surface and not contract the bottom surface. This is going to give you a differential contraction in the system, which would cause the whole thing to bend. And it bend in one direction, that is, it bend always in the direction in which you've drawn the line. So the surface on which you've drawn the line, the curving is going to be in that direction. Okay. There are some other practical problems with this. Is this you can't really make the patches too small because if you make the patches too small, then it's going to quickly lose all its heat to the white boundaries and it's not going to shrink. Uh, so it just we figured out that some number which we find out was greater than four mm is the minimum thickness that you require for the patches to work. Uh, you also cannot have very large patches because if you have very large patches, then you tend to get little instabilities in the problem. Because then you don't have much control over it and bending can just go everywhere. The third problem is that even if the structure is to start up with all the printing and everything is start up to be have no chirality in the system, when you hit them, it can break spontaneous symmetry in the problem and you can give up a chirality in the system. So you basically can get twists and turns which comes up. Some of them are sometimes what you want and sometimes it's not unwanted. There's another problem that you have in this particular field is this that if you're using this material, you can't have an isolated patch because if you have an isolated patch, you realize what will happen is you're going to heat it up. The moment it heat up, the lower the local temperature goes up, the black portion becomes hotter, and it's going to pull on from the side. And the material in the side is not not amiable enough; it is not going to flow. So you're going to tear apart. So that's something that you cannot do. So your design parameters are such that you can't have really thin strips, cannot have very large strips. You cannot have isolated dots. So this is basically what you, what the limitations we have to work in with whatever designs that you come around. So here is this process. What you want is you want to identify the shape, figure out what the shape that you want. You want to get a pattern out of it, whatever be the pattern. Then you want to print that pattern onto this particular transparency sheet that you have. And then place the transparency sheet under IR lamp and have thing place that, what you expect is, you expect something like this that if I heat it up, uh, this is going to contract and give it the shape that I actually want. So I'll give you a simple shape up here, but as I talk, I'll show you how many much more complicated shapes can be got from this. So you see that I really wanted to have a part of a sphere built up there, and that's what I did. And it was not sequential in nature, right? Okay. Before I start, let's just go into some. Uh, really basic stuff about it. Suppose you wanted this material and you wanted to not do shape but just a length because that's a one dimensional version of the problem, which is the easiest to appreciate. So, I actually have something which is a length L0 and I want to get to some length L1. 
And if you were to give a Caesar, what you would have done is basically cut that L minus L naught one part out, and you would have got this particular thing, right? If you had a material which would be infinitely contractible, then that's what you would have got. You would have just taken a length, just contract out all the black portion of it, and then you would have got the length L one. So you start with the length L. Uh, so I'll start with the length L0 up here and you just want to go to a length which is L1. Instead, because you have a finite contraction in the system, and we know this is, you can get the contraction roughly at about 50%, you are limited with the maximum amount of contraction that you can do in this particular system. So that limits what kind of systems that you can actually build out of it. So this just tells you that if I want to go to L2, L1, what is the length of my white portion that I have and what is the length of the B portion that I should have? B is the black portion and obviously this varies as a function of gamma. Now, let's start with something which is inspired by a tailoring process and which is the simplest to uh, uh, appreciate. So what does the tailor do? The tailor cuts. And what are we going to do? We are going to do a contraction of the whole thing. So let's take that this is a shape that we want, a pretty complicated shape that we have here. And I want to contract this out. So what is my geometry that I do? I basically say, well, I have two parameters in the problem. One is to describe any of these shapes whatever be that shape. I basically have something to do with my S, that's I, I fall along the uh, longitude line. So think of this as longitudinal lines and think of the circles which are at given height as some latitude lines. Okay? So I come down at a longitudinal line, reach a point, whatever be that point up here, say topic, topic of Capricorn or Cancer, and then basically along the longitude, like an ant move up and, and find out what is the perimeter of this particular circle up here. Okay? Now what you do is you take, you go to a flat sheet of paper, move along S1 up here, then go along this exactly traverse this exactly the same perimeter that you had covered at, here at this. So whatever be that equator, uh, your tropic of cancer's perimeter, you exactly cover that tropic of cancer's perimeter up here. You realize because it's on a curved surface, thus the, the and it's here it's a, it is a uh, positively curved surface. So essentially the perimeter that you will get, you're going to get a perimeter which is going to be smaller than what you'd have drawn for on a circle. So essentially this is the idea that you do. You start from here, go up to here, form a perimeter up here, then from this line, holding this line, draw a circle on a flat sheet of paper. Okay? What you're going to get is you're going to get, a, get an angle which is opened up and you color that particular sector as black. And you do it for all values of Bs uh, that you can get. So, so essentially, all of these values of S are from here, starting from here, you end up here. You basically start from somewhere from the center and end up up to here. And you basically get various portions which are not covered by this circle's perimeter. So these are the black portions. These are the portions that you want to contract out. So you can do this. And essentially, there is a little game that you play here that I told you that, you know, I really don't want very large areas to be black. So I distribute these black areas in such a way that they are evenly distributed in the angular direction, such that uh, you know not very large uh, non-linearities don't take place at one point. So that's your example. If you have this pattern, you get this shape. If you have this pattern, this is like a Gaussian, you get this shape. These are, these are examples of solids of revolution, but you can get other shapes, which is like, a, you know, this is like a dia, this is like some other part of a of a part of an ellipsoid. This is a part of a, uh, a saddle. You can get any shape that you can do this. So the, these are these are processes that you can get and and essentially get the right print, print it out and get the shape out. However, there is some trick that I messed up. Is this that for for example that I have these two shapes, and I describe the entire problem only defining about the line which is along the longitude. So I just say that I'm only going to move along S1. Right. What about the height information in the problem? In that way, this particular shape and this particular shape are exactly the same. Because if you go up from here at the S1 and draw a little circle up here, which is your latitude, and draw this S1 up here and draw the latitude up here, you'd find the perimeters to be the same. So essentially, if the print would exactly come out to be the same for both for this case and that case. And you know that the embedding is different. This is a very different shape than that shape. This is a shape in which the bending is always in one direction. This is a shape in which the bending goes in one direction and moves in the other direction. This is where within that, this idea that, you know, why don't we use this bimetallic idea of ours, which tells me that, you know, I could print it in two different parts. The part that I want to bend it in one direction, that part I print it on the top, and the rest of the part I print it at the bottom. So that is another uh, tool that we have 
to actually curve out these kinds of shapes. So this allows you to to embed these kinds of shapes, which are which actually in terms of the the circles is basically has the same same perimeter. And uh, just to make sure that you know this this shapes actually quite fit quite well to the target shapes. It's about two point five to four percent, five percent is is what you get the difference from the target shape to what you have. And that's that's to do with the tailoring method. Okay. Now we have the other method, which is to say with uh, you know how do I do with something which is like uh, changing the uh, the square to the palindrome. This is what we thought about Chebyshev's nets. So it turns out that if you were to be on a Shankar, Shankar, yeah. maybe a, it's like a stupid question, but the resolution of your similarity of the shape of desired shape to what you get. Does that depend on number of lines that you define uh, at the end? So, yeah, so it does depend upon the number of lines that we define at the end. But it also is limited by the fact is that we cannot go beyond a particular small amount. See, so this is a material right. problem because if I can't make lines very thin, right. well, if I make the lines very thin, yes, I do distribute the contraction all over the place, but the line won't just get hot. So essentially, I won't get anything. Got it. Got it. So it also tells you that the designs are not scalable straight up. So every time that you want to scale to a different design, you have to find out ways in which you have to distribute these patterns all over the space. Okay, that's that's algorithmic, but anyway, that's that's one thing that you have. Anyway, so now we have this whole thing that you have. Uh, uh, we want to generate something like the Chebyshev's net. So we want to convert this whole thing not in the not in the way that I was doing, but in a slightly more general way, and to say that well, I have a flat surface. And on a flat surface, the distance between two points is given by Pythagoras theorem, right? You say x square plus y square is basically your your DSS square, which basically tells you that you know what is the distance between the two points. Now, if you were to go on a surface, then it just turns out that that distance is now not a function of dx square and dy square, but also some functions of e and f and g. And a dx dy is somewhere in the middle. So essentially, it tells you that those e, f, and g's are functions of the local points that you have. For every point in x, y, you have a particular value. So essentially, this is what you are dealt with. You are basically dealing with a matrix which has e, f, and f, g up, sitting up here. Okay. So, so that's what you have. And this is what we want to utilize this. However, I also told you something that we were doing with the material which is only to do with contraction. Now, look at a flower. That the reason that the flower has its floppy sides on the edges is because you are trying to put in a larger perimeter into a smaller perimeter. So anything which is negatively curved, it's negatively curved because you're trying to fix in some perimeter which is much larger than what you'd have otherwise got from a flat sheet of paper. This is why when you clear plastic, you basically see a lot of rippling on, on its surfaces because you're trying now, the shear has flown the plastic up. And the plastic has become longer, but you know the edges are fixed, and that's why you, you go floppy all over the place. So all your floppy hats and all have this particular aspect. But here I'm dealing with only contraction. So that would happen if I had an expansion in the system. So the way we get rid of this problem is to start with a sheet, which the thing would call a C trick. It'd be like you know, you try start with a tree, it's thing which is actually of a bigger size. Okay, so you don't start with a seat which is exactly mapped down from the top. But you, you, you account for this that I'm going to contract always, either contract less or contract more. So I'm only going to be from a larger sheet. So I basically start from a larger sheet. And this, this associate allows you to do both contraction as well as expansion, implement both those algorithms here. So you can, that's why you could get a negatively curved surface. Otherwise, you would never have got a negatively curved surface. So here is this geometry, right? I have some, some curved surface and I've given you the geometry f is a function of x, y. And that allows you to find the elements of E, F, F, and G at every point because you know the function up there. All those E, F, and I've written it doesn't matter. You know, there is a way of finding out just from that function you can find out what this these values of this matrix are at every point on your grid. So every point x, y has a value of E, F, F, and G. So essentially, that matrix is known to you. So what you are left with is now with any matrix, what you do is diagonalize it. Find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So what you do is, once you diagonalize it to find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues, what you find is that you find the way that this square has to be rotated. That's what your eigenvector gives you, and it also tells you how are you going to contract it. So you are going to basically contract it on one side and expand it from the other side. Okay. So, so if you think of instead of the squares, you think of little circles up there at every point. At every point, these circles are going to convert itself from a circle. 
to an ellipse. Okay, and you will have an ellipse. That means I have to contract it in one direction. I have to expand it in the other direction. It turns out that what you do basically is if C was my initial uh, radius of my system, and if lambdas and mu's are my eigenvalues of of my this matrix E F F G, and remember this this is locally at every point you do this. You basically contract this direction along this direction by C by root over lambda, and the other direction you contract it by C by root over mu. That's what you do. Okay, so once you do this implementation, what you can do is this is the way that we implement it. So essentially, break this whole grid into into little rectangular grids, in which you have two cross bars, and these cross bars, the angle of the cross bar is set by the eigen uh, vector of it, and these widths are set up by the eigen values of that function. So it tells you that how much am I going to contract it along in that direction. So that's what you have. So for example, if I want to make a saddle of this kind of a shape. I will basically print out this kind of a shape on on the printer, and if I heat it up, I will basically get sorry I probably missed the image, but I'll basically get a shape which corresponds to the saddle. However, there is a problem with this. That though this gets a metric right, it doesn't get get always the shape right, and you realize this because you can get from a flat sheet of paper you can get various shapes, right? So all this cone, uh, whatever this particular shape is. All of these three shapes have a metric which is given by dx squared plus dy squared. So just getting the metric right doesn't necessarily give you the shape right. You can get a class of shapes with it, but you can't really get. If I want to, if I'm really uh, hell bent on saying that you know I want a soccer ball and not a rugby ball, I'll basically land up into a problem. Okay, so I I can get a lot of surfaces which are surfaces of constant Gaussian curvature, but not necessarily the right surface that I can get. So I just don't have the control over that. The last problem that you would look at it is something which is called as a distance molding. Before I go into the next part where I look up at the dynamics of the system, the distance molding would be that you know you have any surface like this, and then you say that if I want to uniquely define every point in the z z points, so x, y, and z has to be uniquely defined. How do I do this? I basically go about and say I apply constraints on the system. If I have constraint in the system, I make the system rigid. That means. Within my equivalence class, that by translation and rotation, whatever I can do, all those points are going to be at the same distance away from each other. So if you can maintain the distances from each other, then you can actually implement this algorithm. And how do you do this? So what do you say is well, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to tile down my bottom uh, sheet by some equilateral triangle. So that's my choice. I could have done something else, but let me do it with equilateral triangles. So you can see this bottom sheet. That is the sheet on which I am drawing. This is my shrinking rings, and I basically want to have these triangles. Now, what do I want to do? I essentially want to see these triangles and map this triangle onto some triangle which is on the top. Now, this is an equilateral triangle, and I want to have a triangle which is mapped. So, these are three points, and those three points gets mapped onto the surface that I have on the top. This is the surface that I want to craft out. Realize that this circle, this surface, this particular triangle doesn't have to be an equilateral triangle. It can be anything else, right? But I know the distances a priori because I know the function. I know the distances between all the points. So, as for example, if if I want knew the distances, then the pattern would be that I would go up and basically write down a pattern which is almost like this. What you see is in the yellow pattern. When you contract it, then this a1 and ajs. So this a1, ajs, aks are basically the points which you have on the bottom surface. Okay. So and when they when they contract, they basically give you the right distances and help you to get the object that you have on the top. So you can realize that what you have up here is those little three triangles that you have up here, which is greenish. Those are the three triangles which should contract and then come together, and that's the whole idea of it. That you get, get these three triangles contract and get them together, and that should give you the distance. So you can see that this is the print. I want to have a part of a sphere. I think this is a part of a sphere, and you can see there's a lot of contraction that has to happen from the from the outer boundaries, and this is what you have in the system. So these are examples. This is a part of a sphere. This is a part of a uh, this is a Gaussian. So this is basically In a in a metric molding, I wouldn't be able to distinguish between this shape and that shape. Both of them have the same Gaussian curvatures, and Gaussian curvatures being product, you realize one can go fast, fall faster than the other, and the products can remain the constant. So these two shapes can be identified. You can get a saddle, and you can get what not. Okay. Now, so the conclusion of the first part is, uh, uh, Jyotishman, how am I doing with the time? Yeah, it's it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's like you you're now thirty minutes into it. It's okay, fine. So I have the other part. So. Uh, So essentially, uh, the conclusions would be that the tailoring method is the best. 
Uh, this is because you're running white strips and that kind of gives you the overall control over the system. So essentially you need, otherwise, you know, things tend to go haywire and you can get, uh, get unwanted bendings that you can have in your system. The metric molding gives you the intrinsic metric. So you can say the class of shapes can be right. So you, if you want a positively curved surface, you tend to get a positively curved surface, but whether it's a soccer ball or a rugby ball, you just can't make sure between the difference between the two. Uh, so you don't have a direct control over the shape. Uh, the distance molding is extremely uh, powerful in terms of algorithmic. So you can write any algorithm. You can, so we, essentially there are codes which are available now on GitHub. So you can download that code, just print it out, give it a function, it'll, it'll do it for you. Uh, however, uh, there is a requirement that the polygons have to seamlessly come together and fit into each other. That that kind of gives you sometimes kinetically kinetic this problem. For example, if one moves ramps up faster than the other one, then you can get into kinetics, this kind of the same thing that you get in glasses and all, that those kinetics can stop you from getting into some global minima unless you do it carefully and the heating protocols are done per perfectly right. Uh, and if you have an error, that's the problem with it. If you start getting an error, then the error tends to propagate. And because the error tends to propagate, sometimes this can get you into a wrong thing if the heating protocol is not maintained properly or if there is uh, non-uniform heating in the system. However, the advantage over the origami is that none of these methods need to need contraction sequentially. You don't have cutting, you don't have doing, it's, a, it's an algorithmic method of getting things done. So you can you give it a shape, you have this code which are available, you can just print it onto it and then get the shape out. I think there's a question by Sagar. Do I take the question now? Yes, I can. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, why do you uh, assume that uh, in origami everything would have to be done sequentially? I mean, uh, in origami also there are techniques in which things can be done non-sequentially as well. I mean, uh, parallelly uh, things getting folded. Yes, that is true, but uh, uh, would it be for any arbitrary function shapes? For certain shapes it's true, uh, Sagar, that you can do it. Uh, yes, uh, I was talking about the general algorithm by uh, Tosh, uh, uh, Tomohiro Tachi, uh, he designed this algorithm called as origamizer, in which you can literally use what we call as the simplicial decomposition of any 3D model, and then we can uh, fold it automatic. I mean, there's methods for folding it, and it's not sequential. Oh, it's not sequential? It's okay. I stand corrected. So, yeah. Okay. okay. So, okay. So now that I've, I've defined to you what shape and function shape was, now let me get to some little bit of functionality with it. Now, okay. You can also get shapes in slightly different ways. The so one way of getting a shape would be that, you know, you have a car, uh, which is a functionality and you have built parts of it. Uh, and obviously it's an extremely complex object. It has a shape and it has a very well function that you can burn fuel and take you from one point to the other one. Uh, so that's one kind of thing which is very high on fun uh, functionality, but also very high on complexity. And in the course of this next part of the talk, I want to convince you that, you know, the shape plays a very important role. In, in getting things uh, uh, functional by uh, by doing some interlocking uh, mechanisms in it. So, so let's look at the first example of it and no doubt one of these examples came from Da Vinci and uh, he had this Da Vinci bridge which basically allows you to build a bridge without, now I do not want cutting and gluing here, here there are no rivets, no joints, no glue, no ropes, no rails, right? So you basically can get a bridge out of all of that. In fact, if you look in the commercial version of what you get as Da Vinci's toys, and these are known as the Leonard sticks, and you can buy it on Amazon. This basically have, have cuts on them, and by locking uh, uh, objects, rods between each other, you can actually create many geometric shapes out of it. That's a game that you can play. So interlocking helps you. Now, if you go to the, the field, the, what do people want to do is, and you can have the M-bot, the K-bot, or the living crystals. The idea here is that you want to assemble a large shape. Why do you want to assemble a large shape out of small parts? Because you believe that the large uh, collection of these large shapes could do something which a single shape cannot do. So the M block is, and what do you need for it? You basically need some way of moving one object from one point to the block. You also need some way of locking one object into the other object. Because if you don't lock into each other, it will just fall off. Now, the M block is basically, a, it's from MIT, and basically the idea is that you have gyros inside it which spins hard. And once it spins, it gives you the enough energy to actually bounce from one point to the other point. So it allows you locomotion in the system. Uh, the, there are magnets in the system, which basically are magnets up here, which tends to get them locked into one shape to the other. Now, the other thing which is taken almost to the field of, of swarm robotics by Storm is this idea of K bots, which has come out. K come from Kilobots from Harvard. 
And here the idea is that you know I have the little motors and uh, they kind of wiggle around with each other. And I can give it a functionality. The functionality in this point mean that I'm going to tell it where to go to, and uh, and it can and it can assemble itself into particular shapes that it can. So that's the two things that you have from the robotics field. But people in the liquid in the colloidal field has also been trying to get such shapes. Is basically something that the NYU group had done it is to take little iron particles and cover them with polymers and then make them light sensitive so that once you flash on the light, the particles come together. And once you flush up the lift, I take the light out, and the, then the thing basically disperses off. So this is the idea, right? So you want to take many particles together, bring them together, and do some functionality out. I want to do it a very minimalistic approach. What I want to do is I want to say that two is different than one. Okay? Things which one cannot do, two can do. So this is in, in condensed matter physics, we say that you know that just having one more degree of freedom can just change you a lot of things in your system. So one of these examples, let me show one of those examples, which is quite early. But anyway, it's, it's interesting to show. The idea was that we had taken this particular uh, we had taken this example, uh, and Nitin had spoken about it in one of the colloquiums and I said colloquiums. So the idea was that you take two dumbbells. And these dumbbells are basically made from little small uh, spheres that you, you make necklaces out of it. And you connect them with this earbuds uh, plastic that you have between them. So essentially you collect them together and you put these dumbbells inside uh, a rotating cylinder. Now this cylinder has nothing in it except that it's a hollow cylinder and on purpose I made it tilted uh, and the reason that I made it tilted was that it looks nice that you can find that these two structures would assemble together and they would climb out and I would convince yourself that you know if you trust me uh, at this point that if I had put in a single dumbbell up here it wouldn't do so. And if I had also put in dumbbells at the wrong configuration, it wouldn't do so. So our dumbbells coming together at the right configuration do assemble and do show you a locomotion to go up. And the reason it works is, is because these dumbbells are anisotropic objects. So essentially, let's look at the geometry before I explain to you in a short while. So let's take at the day the cylinder. I will take phi to be the azimuthal angle on the cylinder and eta to be a to be along the axis okay? and what do I do is I basically would put these dumbbells onto this geometry. Now this this particular parameter I have opened it in terms of phi, phi is my x axis so let me just phi is my phi is my x axis up here and eta is my y axis up here and you realize that if I have a dumbbell which is like this oriented and if it has to slip down, it will roll down easily. But if the dumbbell has a different orientation like this, it will take a larger angle to slip. And that's just intuition. Now, okay, so what happens is as you start to rotate the whole cylinder, you, you basically get the dumbbell to go up in height. So let me also tell you this, this basically all these parallel lines that you see, or this parallel, this. These lines that you see are basically lines of constant energy. So as you go up, the energy is going up. Okay. So you basically have a dumbbell which goes up. Now as it rotates, the dumbbell gains height. You can see the dumbbell was some here, lower right height, has risen up in eta. And now what happens is it starts to roll down. Okay. As it rolls down, it gains eta. So that's how it works. The problem with this geometry is, can you can realize that you know lots of these streamlines follow. There will be a torque here. There will be another torque up here. So let me just show the torques. There will be a force up here and there will be a force up here and those forces are not going to be the same. So essentially a single dumbbell will always turn and in such a way that the dumbbell will actually come down. However, if you have two dumbbells together with each other, they kind of interlock with each other and that interlocking allows it to be always in an energy absorbing state. So you can get to an energy absorbing state and do this. If you had cylinders, for example, cylinders also have the same advantage, it rolls and slides. But there is no interlocking in the system, so cylinders don't work. So let me show you another example. This is what happens when you're in a lockdown, right? So what we do is we, I took, I was playing around with it one day that, you know, you take the two pencils and put them into a cylinder. And I'll, I'm sure that most of you who have seen toothpicks have found that the toothpicks actually have a very nice chiral state to it. They have a handedness to the way that they pattern out. The reason is the two toothpicks don't actually pass through the center of it. So. Here was this idea that I took the two toothpicks and doesn't matter whether it's toothpicks or not. If you shake them vertically, these toothpicks tend to rotate. 
you'd be surprised at why would two toothpicks tend to rotate. I'm just shaking it in a vertical, di vertical direction. And, uh, and I can convince you that if it was a single toothpick, then basically what you'd have seen is the current would actually have been zero. You wouldn't have seen a toothpick. And what I'm doing up here is I'm basically, uh, with this gamma, what you see up here for various gamma is I'm changing the drive in the system. So you can see if the drive is small, then the curves are a little small. As you increase the drive, you kind of go up, up, up. And then at some point, you start to get very noisy and the current actually starts to flip. That's the point when actually what will happen is this, this particular toothpick changes its orientation. So what is ahead and what is behind, and that those orientations, those configurations change. And then the chirality changes the problem and the chirality changes and basically you have a current in the opposite direction. So here is a system where single uh, pencil stick or a single uh, toothpick is not chiral. But if you put a collection of them, then it becomes a chiral state. In a chiral state, you can get a current in the system. Right? So let's show some non other non-intuitive parts of it. Suppose I had a ring and you could think of some track on which you have a person and a person is walking and it has some velocity. If I, if I put in a lot of these people on the top of it, you realize what would happen is the velocity would go down, right? So essentially what you'd expect is the velocity to go down as the density goes up. Let me show you what happens for this case of toothpicks. This is what I would say is that look at this red dots just for you to consider it on. And this is a low, left one is a low density, the right one is a high density system. And you can see that as you have a low density, it flips. But if you go to a higher density system, you find that the frequency at which it moves is higher. So the velocity increases instead of decreasing with density. Obviously, at some point it's going to fall down, but you know, because you're going to get an extremely jammed state. But here is another counterintuitive example in which, first of all, you wouldn't have expected two toothpicks to have a rotation, which itself is, a, is an interesting phenomenon by itself. But you also wouldn't expect the density to go up and the current to actually also go up. You'd expect that the density goes up and the system becomes more crowded. And hence, what I have is basically a lower velocity. Instead, it gives you exactly the opposite. So you can do it with toothpicks, you can do it whatnot. You basically get something which would which would initially go up and then fall down. The going up part is extremely robust. It doesn't matter what you do with it, whether it's glass rods, steel rods, rods with some rounded bottoms, rod with not so rounded bottoms, different friction, spray down with whatever you want. The initial part of the curve always collapses onto each other. The, la the later part of the curve, which is basically the curve which falls, is, is susceptible to the way things jam with each other. And that's where, when the universality is lost in the problem. So let's come to the example three. This is an example again, which is uh, which I've shown earlier also. But anyway, I just wanted to point out because it will allow me to go to the example four. Here was this example in which I have a, a lot of metal balls, which is at the bottom of a glass cylinder. And uh, and what you, you do is the moment you start uh, moving the glass cylinder, and remember what, what, what I have is, I basically have a glass cylinder, which is horizontal, okay? So when you're, you're looking from the top into the surface, and obviously that if you had a water, then you realize what that water would be. The water would look like, uh, give you some parabolic kind of a shape. That's what a tilted glass bottle would give you. So you should have a symmetric shape about the about a line, which is something like that. So you want to have expected a very symmetric shape out of this. So uh, if, you, if you start to spin the system up, Yeah, if you start to spin the system up, you find that the system goes towards exactly towards one side. Um, you flip the direction of it, uh, and then so you essentially see this is the part which is actually rotating, and you can see this is the defect lines that you have. And the moment that you flip this whole thing up, the moment you flip this whole thing, the shape goes. So you see that the shape is basically a very anisotropic shape. And this would almost mean that the load exerted from here or the load exerted by one particle is the same. So essentially, it just says the load is not transmitted in the system. And that happens because friction is not the uh, same system. It's one number in a system. In, in objects which can both roll and slide, uh, you can partition these objects into something which is rollers and sliders. The rollers come in the beginning part of it. So the, the edge is actually filled by rollers. And the trail is filled by sliders in your system. So, so you can do simulations about it and then see the same thing. So you have rollers and sliders in the system. So if you are looking at it in, from a statistical point of view, you would see that, yes, here I have a system 
and I would have expected in equilibrium statistical mechanics the energy to be the same in all degrees of freedom in a system. Just now here I have system which subtly distributes itself in such a way that some parts of it is hot and some parts of it is cold. So basically they don't have any extra degrees of freedom. With it. So what did we do? So you could use this to make something very interesting. And uh, what we did was we challenged this about 200 year old design of a ball bearing and I'll tell you how we did it. So suppose you are to drive along this particular line. Huh? So this is a this is a basically some hilly road which is crowded. You know what you're going to do? You're going to do the feathering the clutch technique. So what is a feathering the clutch technique? You basically just, just touch on the clutch. What does the clutch do? And people for whom those who don't drive, you realize that the clutch actually is the clutch that holds your motor to your wheel. So when you press the clutch plate, you disengage the wheel with your uh, with the machine with your motor, and when you raise the clutch, uh, your from the clutch, then the two are engaged with each other. Once the two are engaged with each other, then the torque transmission happens between what is the motor and the wheel. And if you have released the whole thing, then there is no torque transmission. So you're switching the system from a high torque transmission to a low torque transmission system. And, I, and this is how it does, and this is why you people tell you don't feather the clutch because if you feather the clutch, your your basically your clutch plate is going to wear out and things like that. However, this particular method of doing a pulse width modulation is something which is routinely done in electrical power transmission. That's how you transmit power. This is why today your uh, regulators that you see on the fan regulators that you see is basically tiny regulators. You know, instead of those bulky regulators that you would have earlier, those where you have just resistors on it. This is how your SMPS works. This is how you can switch mode uh, supply things. Okay, so what did we do? We realized something very simple. We realized that suppose I used a softer object on the top. So this is a standard ball bearing setup, but I use a softer object on the soft top. What does it have? What does it allow me? Is if I have the normal force low, and you can see what will happen. This is just a cartoon to show you how what I've held is a sponge on the top of these these three things, which I I think are fevicol kind of uh, tubes. Okay, so uh, if you try to drive it, well, it drives, it rolls. Fair enough. So you realize that if you drive it, it rolls and rolling is a state in which there is very little amount of uh, force transmission between the sponge and the bottom plane because, after all, you know why should the torque transmission happen? Coefficient of friction is very low. Now suppose I do something else. I just apply a normal force onto it. So I just apply the pressure onto it. The moment you apply a pressure then this, this whole uh, foam is going to deform. And as the foam deforms, now you realize what happens if you try to push it, it's going to move only in a sliding state. Now you try to push it, there's hardly any rotations in your system, right? So just by allowing the system to toggle, allowing the normal force to toggle, instead of disengaging the whole plate, you are going to convert something from rolling to sliding. In a rolling state, imagine if your, if your clutch plate was made with all rollers, there would be no transmission of torque at all. If your clutch plate is made up of sliders, then you have a lot of large uh, force transmission between your clutch plate and the plate. So we figured out that you could do this, and that was an example of a ball bearing. And this is what we found that you know you could, as you fun as you modulated your normal force or the density in your system, you could tune the coefficient of friction that you have. You could tune the toggling that you could have in your system all by saying that you know I could go to a pure rolling if my normal force is low. Just add a little bit of a normal force in your system and immediately you go to a sliding state. A sliding state is a high torque transmission state. A rolling state is a low torque transmission state. So in general, so let's come into the second and last few concluding statements about it. What shape does is it, it gives you state, static hindrances. The reason that the two, two toothpicks started to spin around is because there was a static hindrance. One couldn't go into each other. And people who work with with uh, protein folding, would realize this is almost asking it what would happen if I were to walk along the Ramachandran plot, right on the boundary of the Ramachandran plot, because that's that's the zone which is told tells me that you know I can't get into it. But what about the dynamics on the Ramachandran plot? Okay. Now this would what would this do is it, the static hindrance would pick up walls in my configuration space, so it would tell me that there are certain configurations that are not allowed in my system, right? And forces like fields or you know like gravity or my persistence to move in one direction will typically keep me in one, I could keep the configuration point near one of the walls of this manifold. So it basically will be like this, this particular shape that you have up here. Uh, uh, you can think of them as some, some uh, wall, which is embedded in some very high dimensional space. 
and you find that it's either on the surface or you know, on one of the edges or the corners. This is where the configuration point is going to be. So configuration point is going to be there. And when the configuration point is there, then its local interaction tells you what is going to be the internal state of the system. What do I mean by the internal state of the system? Is it going to be rolling? Is it going to be sliding? And what state it is, and it could be other systems. Also, remember that a governor that you have in a steam engine would tell you that this internal state would tell you how much of power consumption would happen, how much coal would actually burn in the system. So you can design the internal car and you can, you can hold a coupling feedback between these internal states of the system and, uh, the, and the configuration that you have in the system. And that determines what is the energy, total energy flow in the system. So you're controlling the energy flow in a system in a feedback manner. So you realize that in, in a typical way of thinking of friction, there is no feedback because that's the, the friction, you think of it as a constant term, nothing is adjustable in the parameter. But here you say that not only the mobility is adjusted, but it is a frictional coupling is adjusted, every energy injection is adjusted. So you can get to non-trivial uh, states which have only few particles in the system. And all of this will basically give you very non-trivial steady sets. So thank you. So that's that's the whole idea. Okay. Thank you, Shankar. Uh, this was right on time and uh, a very interesting way to uh, look at uh, shapes and functions. So, completely blew my mind. So, uh, Shankar, uh, thank you. So, questions? Questions for Shankar? Yes, Shudipto. Shankar, I really loved it. Uh, I have a question which is except for gravity in all of these, uh, half of your talk. Uh, all forces were like contact forces. They are short-range forces. Yeah. Um, if you add, and it, because you did mention proteins, if you add long-range forces, uh, for example, one over R square kind of thing, do things change a huge amount or do they roughly remain the same barring the details? Uh, have you thought about it? So I so now just now the kind of problem that I am doing is where systems have persistent walking. So you know you have a tendency to move in one direction. This is this would be like mimicking a long range interaction, as if like I have a very long foot and I'm basically pulling something towards me. So there's a drift in the problem. So very far up. So those things also tend to give give these kinds of problems. You know, this kind you can use them. So suppose you have I'm recasting the problem. Suppose I had entities which tended to move in one direction, like bacteria, right? They, they tend to move in one direction, then suddenly change. Suppose you have persistence in walk, then also this kind of holds true. Then also you find that your your uh, your your states are not equally pro pro probable, but corners are more probable. Those walls, structures near the walls are more probable than everything else. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, Nitin, please go ahead. The question is ahead. to Shankar. Shankar, you want to tell why more um, toothpicks rotate faster? You want to leave it to your audience as exercise? Uh, Nitin, that will take a long time, actually. Uh, no, I, I, I'll say it in uh, one sentence. Okay, tell me. The transmission comes because of the angle between the toothpick and the bottom. And the angle changes when there are more toothpicks. It becomes more slanted in the direction of the rotation. Actually, no. Allowing more transmission of force. Sorry, Nitin. To, to, it's not, not that. Way. No? No. Okay, so, we'll discuss. Yeah, we'll have to come back to this. It's not that. I will come to TIFR and we will discuss. Sure. <laughs> just, for, just for the audience, just for the audience, uh, Nitin Nitsure is, uh, 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 of course, our resident mathematician uh, in the, the School of Mathematics. Uh, so he and Shankar, of course, uh, talked about this problem. I think Shankar mentioned it in the earlier slides. Just wanted to tell it to students and audience who are hearing for them, both of them for the first time. Yeah. Okay, Shankar. Uh, questions for Shankar? Yeah, my three. I was wondering if there was some way you could also print patterns that could cause extension or expansion rather than contraction. And then could you think of having ways by which you could expand one side and contract the other? So, my three, this is, uh, this is, so the method that we have is general method. Now, our printing on this particular thing was this is what was easily available. But we have not generalized it. Uh, had you not left uh, TIFR, you know, and the COVID not stuck, this is what we, I was trying to talk to you about. 
that you know if we could put in other kinds of materials maybe maybe sell something else which actually has gives you both contractile and extensile forces in the system and then one could actually think about you know patterning things where you can design shapes out of it that's just active matter and then you could also look at whether you would require to do them sequentially or whether you could just sure. do them simultaneously yeah. sure. okay okay there are a show of hands um, thank you mitre thank you for joining thank you um and, uh, sagar we'll go with sagar first then shrihar uh yeah so uh, my question was regarding the initial experiments which is shown in which uh, you were using a material and uh, over that there was a uh, light shining and then there was the black part which would contract and then the other one which would not contract right yes sagar and uh, you mentioned a difficulty over there by saying that uh, at most it can uh, go for 50 i mean uh, only 50% uh, shrinkage right that is true contraction would be 50% at most so uh, instead of that uh, is it possible to use something like a memory alloy something like a heat memory alloy which uh, just by heating it uh, changes shape i mean that way it can uh, work with much less than 50% i mean it can contract much less than 50% in that sort of scenario so, uh, sagar the uh, okay, let me so this particular idea of using heat memory uh, shape memory alloy if that's correct yeah. shape memory alloys is uh, something that people try today in self assembly robots this yeah. is probably you know something that you would probably know more than i but let me just put it this is a this is an origami idea so what yeah. you do here is that you use those shape memory alloys to get your fold which will tuck in the see shape memory alloy doesn't cause you any contraction but what yeah. shape memory alloys can do is it can create a fold and then hide the fold between two things right yes so that is the that is the other way around of it that is to create folds in your system and then hide the fold in between you uh, know whatever the structure okay, okay, okay. so in this scenario there's no hiding it's all just contraction no hiding. this is all contraction ah, okay, okay, okay okay thanks thank you thank you sagar uh, we are shriharsh and then pushan pushan i hope is here so Thanks, Shankar. This was a, a great talk. Um, so I had two questions. One was about uh, this um, stretching and contracting of the sheets. Uh, I'm wondering whether, if we had the ability to print some uh, something that would change the uh, the rigidity of the material at at small scales, can we have a better control on how they how they fold? You are right that. Uh... this this finally it actually becomes a of a, a material property uh, uh i don't know whether it's just the rigidity of the material also but what happens is if you have lot of portions and that will happen with any any particular scale that you go to comparatively you will still have a lot of portion that has to be contracted out the problem here is that there is no feedback processes in the whole thing so even if you if there was some way of of say for example let me just give you an example of Suppose there was some way of heat gradient, like you know, some materials had a way that you know, first, first I become heat hotter, then I contract a bit, then depending upon a higher temperature, my contraction coefficient becomes a temperature dependent thing. Those kind of nonlinearities one could probably use to get a better shape. So I think there is a lot of game that one can play around with the material properties itself. Right. Uh, yeah. So that could give you rise to some some feedbacks which is no more there in the just simple as that in this model. This is all mm -hmm. like runaway singularities, whatever, whatever happens. okay just to follow up on that point uh, so you you have you have uh, said a lot about you know you don't want sequential folds but sometimes the sequencing of the folds will help you get the shape you desire so sure. in, uh, right now you are printing say black on white and then you know using infrared lamps but if you had uh, you know just as a experimental thing if you had uh, a, a resonant absorber which absorbs specific colors then you could actually sequence Uh, which folds happen first and which folds happen later? Absolutely true. I mean, even at this scale, I could have tricked it by using a red, green, and a blue print print. Mm -hmm. you know, that would have different uh, extensions of my thing, and I could have made it sequential. Uh, my not getting sequential was just like a that was a question that was posing to me. Then I mean, not necessarily that that something that one shouldn't do. In fact, you're right that you know there are certain places that where where. A sequence, a sequence is required. You want to go do or do it in sequentially, and not necessarily that you want to do away with all the sequencing in the system. And uh, you're right that if you, and also true that light is a bad thing because light gives you shadowing. So if you had suppose a microwave or something else where I had a, I had a particles which could absorb, and uh, where the shadowing effect is small, 
that would have been much better because here the problem is always that you know if one goes over the other and shadows it then that creates a problem so those kinds of material problem material things we have not actually yeah, explored you're right absolutely okay. yeah thank you uh, so i had just one last thing about the uh, the beads with connected by a rod uh, the video you showed yeah when the, the when the first one drops out of the tube yeah the other one also drops out of the tube why is that why oh, why because i'll tell you this so let's just go to this suppose uh, no let's just go to this okay. so suppose i go here now i have a single single bead right here in this particular simulation that i'm uh, yeah. in animation that i'm seeing even this would have climbed up see the problem is not even a single bead would have climbed up the problem is that the single bead would not keep his heading right because what would happen is you can look at this bead and you can say that there are two streamlines passing through it and so essentially there is a torque acting on it right. what would the torque do the torque would turn its heading in a way so that the that the lines are going to be like flat so this is the, going to be the configuration that it's going to be in. now that would say that you know i can't absorb energy anymore so locally even if it if, so if i had given the object some kind of a tilt to start out with it would actually go up for some time and then turn and then then turn back so there would be a persistent in which it would go up that's what he exactly saw there that though the first object had gone, gone up but it was very close to the to, to the to the top end uh, and it hadn't time to actually turn and then go down right so the torque didn't have enough time to straighten it so yeah. okay. thanks thank you thank you shyar um kushal yeah uh, so so shankar uh, as usually very thought provoking talk and uh, the question i i i'm going i was going to ask uh, un unusually you have already answered it just now but i'll still go ahead because i i'm not very clear about uh, the initial uh, reason for that the, re the question is uh, why this uh, sort of fetish about non sequential uh, because you know sequentiality is neither a problem mathematically nor is it a problem in the in the industry which you are also interested in so why do you make a condition may, may i answer question uh, so nitin wants to take that question okay. yeah. sure so, sure sure please. question yeah we do a flash heating you know yeah our method of heating is flash heating yeah. short exposure and then that heats it and it curls yeah? yeah now because uh, we do this flash heating and we have flat sheet we know how much uh, radiation each part is going to receive yeah but once it curls up we have, we don't have that control uh, because then one thing will yeah, come yeah. over the other and you won't be able to heat the things which are coming in the shadow of the front material and so yeah that, that is true but uh, you could have it was uh, only other... a problem of the yeah. method we used but if you okay. have another method of heating then you can uh, very well do sequential okay okay like just now just now some, something was talked about like using different kinds of color for heat no immersion in a heat bath for example yeah exactly exactly so there is many there's other no, methods uh, you know and uh, so sequential is possible of uh, course sequential uh, uh, will produce more things we only tried the simplest it was just a practical so he was reporting the simplest practical right right so it was just a practical issue this is a practical issue nothing more than that okay fine thank you okay thank you kushal yeah uh and uh, any other questions okay shankar uh, the audience seems to be happy and uh, uh, all of us seem to be very happy thank you shankar for this very interesting talk and uh, something that now uh, i have an answer there are some questions you... on the on the chat do you want to take them then? oh yes yes there, there is there is actually actually that, that's correct i wanted to take that i'm sorry, sorry. uttam uttam um Thanks, Shankar, for recognizing that I was missing that out. Uttam, could you unmute yourself and ask the question? I think it is with respect to a particular uh, example you showed. Uttam, I think Uttam has left. I guess Uttam is here. Okay, Uttam, uh, could you unmute yourself? Uh, hello. Yes. Yes, Uttam. Yes. Uh, I just. um try to understand the upward movement of the balls is exactly the inverse situation of the liquid when you rotate spin on a bucket then parabolic shape and this is the inverse situation uh, um this is mathematical this is inverse situation suppose uh, in a liquid if you uh, if you solid ball if you pull uh, put it 
it, it will uh, it will go down. Uh, but uh, honest, uh, in a bucket of uh, sand, if you put the ball, it, it will remain on that. Uh, it is the inverse situation. Now, if you want to put the ball in the uh, sand bucket, then if you start the sand, back, sand bucket, then it will go down. Uh, this is the just inverse situation. I understand the situation mathematically like this, generalized. What is your opinion? Nitsure, Professor Nitsure is also there. I actually understand the situation. So, Professor Nitsure does not understand what you are saying and doesn't have anything to say to that. No, this is this is a situation. These are in physics fun YouTube channel. There are many in there are many. No, no I don't gadgets. understand is all that I'm saying. What is this inverse and sand oh, and whatnot? I think our paper is published to read it and then we can discuss. No, no, Shankar may understand because he has mentioned in his uh, abstract rattleback, tippy top. These are all in the physics fun YouTube. You will see there are variety of gadgets are there. And if you try to understand the physics of these gadgets, you will understand everything. Yeah, no, I... The physics of these uh, gadgets. Uh, let Shankar address. Yeah, let Shankar address. I think that, uh, see. Uh, so let's just take this system. Okay. So, for example, in a in a uh, in your uh, spinning fluid, there is a fluid, there is a continuum system, right? You spin it, and then it forms this vortex. That's what you're saying. That's a very nice shape. On depending on what you're doing, actually, it can form a parabola or it can give you something else. Uh, uh, there, there is a there's a lot of material in it. Right? In this particular system, you're right that you know it could it could fall on that classification of a physics stuff. You have that that part. I think I fully. Uh, Technology or statement, and I think that's right. Uh, but uh, regarding this um, uh, mapping to one to the other, or inverse mapping to the one, another, you know, this is even in a, this is one particle system. There is no other particle in the system. So this is there's an open cylinder with just two particles. So even if you had to have a rattlebox toy or a tippy top, for example, if you did the analysis for that, uh, no, I, I, am, I am just mentioned those. Okay, two, two, okay fine, fine. One, I understand. One, um, similar examples are there are many yeah, things. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I would agree that 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 I would agree that there are there are, there are lots of this this very interesting oh, non-intuitive yeah, yeah. uh, physics toys. Yeah, there are many things. Very interesting. Very, and that I agree fully. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, I think uh, if there are no more questions, then let's thank uh, Professor Shankar Ghosh again for a very interesting talk and um, also uh, sort of uh, putting a new, you know, uh, putting a new spin on how to look at shapes and how to create shapes from a flat shape. Um, so um, Shankar, thank you. And also I would like to thank all of you. Um, sorry, my words are wrapping up today. I don't know why, but um, um, so I want to thank all of you and would like to tell you that we will return next week with Professor Obishek De from IACS Kolkata, who is going to talk about CO2 reduction. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for joining. And I would like to thank also the, uh, the crew in the lecture theater for putting this talk in big screen in lecture theater so people can go in and actually sit and uh, hear this. So thank you, Mr. Ji and all the colleagues there. Thank you. I'll stop the live.